Okay, we're here for a third and final session today. Um, I'm joined by Jeremy Lent. So Jeremy is an author and speaker whose work investigates the underlying causes of our civilization's existential crisis and explores pathways towards a, a more life-affirming future. His award-winning book, The Patterning Instinct, A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning, examines the way humans have made meaning from the cosmos from hunter-gatherer times to the present day. His new book, The Web of Meaning, Integrating Science and Traditional Wisdom to Find Our Place in the Universe, offers a solid foundation for an integrative worldview that could lead humanity to a sustainable and flourishing future. Jeremy is the founder of the nonprofit Lyology Institute and writes topical articles exploring the deeper patterns of political and cultural developments at Patterns of Meaning. He has been described by Guardian journalist George Monobot as one of the greatest thinkers of our age. You can learn more about his work at www.jeremylent.com. So, Jeremy, it's absolutely brilliant to have you with us here today. And best of luck with your presentation. And I'll see you in the Q&A. Well, thank you so much, Neil. And um, yeah, I'm just so delighted to be here and um, share my um, thinking and ideas with you all. And I just love um, that uh, today is like this day on meaning, because uh, as you'll see, um, the the books I've written and the ideas I have, they all revolve around this notion of meaning as being a kind of an ultimate source of so much else. So I'm going to uh, share my screen in a moment. And um, as I'm giving this uh, talk, um, I also encourage you, if any thoughts, questions, whatever arise as we're entering into it or in, in the middle of it, please, um, you know, feel free to put them in, in the Q&A, um, even as I'm talking, so that we're in the time we have uh, together um, after I finished, um, you know, you'll be able to share any reflections you have on what I'm unfolding today. This is the title of this presentation today, is The Web of Meaning, um, Integrating Ancient Wisdom and Modern Science to Create a Meaningful Life. So it's a big, uh, big topic. And in fact, I'm going to begin uh, really with a big picture. Um, and this picture is gonna be looking at our earth. Here it is in space, you know, a shared home with all other living beings. And, and the only place that we know of in the universe right now that has life on it. And Life emerged on this beautiful little, um, little jewel of a planet billions of years ago. Um, and, but it's only been in the last really 100,000 or so years that a particular species emerged that began to develop the power to actually affect the quality and the experience of life of pretty much every other um, being on this network of life. So for a moment then I want to pause and ask how, how have we been doing as this powerful human species? And how have we been doing in terms of our way of relating to this beautiful planet? And the daunting and really um, terrible answer is we've been doing a terrible job. And we're all only too familiar at this point with this kind of daunting future that we're actually entering into as a result of climate breakdown with wildfires like out of control around so many parts of the world, floods and droughts, and the knowledge that all these disasters we've been looking at in recent years um, are only going to be getting worse and worse. It was just a few days ago that both the Arctic and Antarctic were registering these massive, crazy, like, uh, temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius above their norms for this time of year. And it's just, we know it's gonna get worse. And in fact, you know, what we uh, have become, what is becoming known sort of nowadays in mainstream understanding is that we're facing a climate emergency. And you may be familiar with some graph that looks something like this. Basically it looks at just the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, how they've been rising over time. And, and if they go at this current rate, we're heading towards this catastrophic, uh, what scientists, serious sober scientists call catastrophic increase in temperature by the end of the century to three or five degrees Celsius. Um, and I guess what's maybe even more scary is that um, 
even if countries actually met uh, their pledges and targets would still be way out of control. And even the more aggressive changes that people talk about uh, would lead uh, to more like a two degrees rise, which in scientist terms are a prescription for disaster. So it's because of the zone of cascading amplifying feedbacks that uh, happen, like melting um, ice, which stops radiating heat um, back out into space and things like that. But here's the thing, even if, we were to find some sort of magic bullet as, um, as a solution to climate breakdown and get it way down to a, a safer zone, even if that could happen, we would still be facing um, so much more devastation because we can really understand climate is more like a symptom of an underlying disease rather than the disease itself. And the disease itself is really this recognition that we are facing vast ecological destruction across the board as a result of what our civilization is doing. Um, so just a few basic statistics, just to get um, kind of sh share with you what I'm talking about, the magnitude. And um, it's like since 1970 alone, there has been a 68% decline in animal populations worldwide. Um, we're actually looking right now at the sixth great extinction of species since life began on earth. The other ones have been caused by um, sort of cataclysmic geological events. This one is caused by the activities of one species, human species. Um, even if things went better in the next uh, part of the century, scientists really predict that we're looking at the virtual annihilation of coral reefs worldwide this century because of what's already been done in the ocean. And the UN forecasts that 95% of Earth's land um, will be degraded by 2050. But maybe of all statistics, the one that I find hardest to get my head around, that is just kind of just blows my mind, is this one, that at the current rates, by 2050, there will actually be more plastic by weight in the ocean than fish. And so with all this devastation that our civilization is doing, what is kind of um, just difficult to even comprehend is the fact that the global production and consumption that has caused this is actually projected to triple. This is according to conservative economist estimates by 2060, triple than uh, everything that we've done right now. So this is why uh, uh, an increasing number um, of earth scientists are looking at the fact that we as a civilization are rapidly heading for a precipice. And um, there was one study that looked at what was called the safe operating space for humanity on earth, looked at what was identified as nine planetary boundaries. And uh, what this, and the results of the study have shown that we've now blown past five of those nine boundaries already. And so scientists everywhere are putting out warnings that are virtually being, being virtually ignored by mainstream media, um, such as soon it will be too late to shift course away from our failing trajectory. Um, one uh, prominent earth scientist says it's very big risk that we will end our civilization. And the UN, ex-UN ex Secretary General Ban Ki-moon just a few years back said, this is a global suicide pact. So looking at this context, it's very reasonable to ask, and, and almost anybody needs to ask this question, how did we get to this place? And, and this is where uh, my understanding of how we got here has a lot to do with meaning and the different ways of meaning making that different cultures have done over history. And in a book that um, I published a few years back um, called The Pattern Instinct, The Patterning Instinct, a cultural history of humanity's search for meaning. I looked at the ways in which what, how different cultures have sort of patterned meaning into the universe from earliest times all the way through to the modern day has actually shaped the course of human history. And one essential finding arose from that particular book from a few years back, which is this kind of aphorism, if you will, that culture shapes values. 
those values shape history. And by the same token, our values that we hold today in our dominant culture will shape the future. So let's take a moment and take a, a look at what are those values that we hold today that are going to shape uh, humanity's future on the earth. And basically, our values, our dominant values are based on separation. I always think this picture is iconic of our world today where everyone there is standing completely separate from each other, connected more with their technology um, than actually <clears throat> connecting with each other and equally disconnected from the food they're eating. None of them even thinking about where that food they're about to you know, um, pay for and just go and sit and eat, where it even came from. <clears throat> and so if we kind of dig down one level deeper, about this um, kind of modern story of separation. These are some of the things that we find are these implicit um, understanding about our reality um, that come from this modern story. They're, oftentimes we don't even think about, but they are foundational to the ways in which most of us make sense of the world. Things like nature is a machine, or <clears throat> um, the idea that humans are separate from nature and that humans are separate from each other. And a sense that human progress arises from the conquest of nature. Um, and from that, <clears throat> sort of adding those elements together comes the sense that the earth itself is a resource to exploit for human benefits. And so the meaning that arises from all these different elements of separation um, is kind of this, that um, as a result of that, the purpose of life is simply just to get wealthy and powerful. Now, in this um, recent book that just got published last year that Neil mentioned, um, The Web of Meaning, I look at these questions and what I show and what we're going to be exploring in this talk today is that every one of those elements of that story of meaning are actually false. They're not just dangerous and driving us to destruction, but they're wrong. And we're going to look <clears throat> at um, evaluating those, it, doing um, an approach that I use in the book, and we're going to be um, using in this, um, in this presentation today, integrating both science and traditional wisdom. So we're going to be looking at some of the findings of modern sciences, such as neuroscience and complexity science, and evolutionary biology and system sciences. And, and we're going to be seeing that they point towards the same deep understanding that traditional wisdom has been talking about for millennia, whether it's been indigenous knowledge from around the world or uh, traditions like Taoism or Buddhism basically all pointing to this recognition of our intrinsic interconnectedness. And what we're going to explore is what kind of meaning arises when we look at the world from this different perspective of interconnectedness. And the way <coughs> we're going to explore this right now is by <coughs> focusing some attention one by one on some of the crucial existential questions that pretty much every human being asks at some point in their life, like, who am I? Where am I? What am I? <clears throat> How should I live? And ultimately, <clears throat> this question of meaning itself, why am I? <clears throat> so let's begin with this first question, who am I? Now, if we were to just ask somebody in the street, basically, um, <clears throat> who's part of our dominant culture, this question about identity, like who, <clears throat> who each of us is as a person, it's likely that whatever answer they give you will come ultimately from this, <clears throat> this famous statement by Descartes from a few hundred years ago, who said, I think, Therefore, I am. <clears throat> and so, some of you may know it from the Latin, cogito ergo sum, 
the most famous statement of philosophy. Now, if you think about what that actually means and underlying it is that our human identity, who I am, exists solely through my conceptualizing faculty. And the implication of that, if that's the case, is that animals and even our bodies are really mere machines. They don't really have a full existence of their own because only that thinking capacity is what gives us our true existence. But what animal scientists have now understood and have reported now for decades is that animals are most definitely not machines. We see, for example, that elephants communicate with each other over hundreds of miles through infrasound. They even perform ceremonies over dead family members. Uh, we now understand from scientists studying them that dolphins and whales talk to each other, what's even been recognized as being in local dialects. And their thoughts to call each other out by name and even to gossip about those that are temporarily absent. <clears throat> we know now that wolves show deep family commitment and the males uh, will help raise the young, you know, until they reach maturity over years. But it's one thing to look at the intelligence and caring of other mammals. But what scientists now understand is that even plants have a profound networked intelligence. We now understand that plants have like a, a distributed intelligence um, with actually up to 20 different senses with which, we, with which they interact with the environment. Plants are known now to act intentionally and purposefully. They learn and have memories and they communicate with each other through what um, biologist Suzanne Simard uh, calls the wood wide web. It's actually this web uh, <clears throat> that the roots use um, interacting with the mycorrhizal fungal network underground to communicate <clears throat> throughout an entire forest. And they even use that web to allocate resources as a community. But here's what's even more stunning. When scientists study single cells and these tiny cells of which we have like roughly 40 trillion of them in, our, in each of our bodies. And what they discover is that even a single cell displays stunning intelligence. A single cell has um, thousands of different sensors and proteins within it that it's organizing all the time. It actually sends and receives hundreds of different signals at a time. A cell is aware of itself and others. It knows what to do. It actually cooperates in community with other cells around it. And together, they'll make decisions as a group. Now, these new understandings of the incredible intelligence of all life around us is something that's still kind of new in science and hasn't yet permeated our modern uh, way of making meaning about the world. But other cultures, and um, even thousands of years ago, intuited this sense of the deep intelligence in nature. And we're going to spend a few moments to look at the ways of thinking of um, Taoist thought uh, from ancient China, from uh, basically about 2,500 years ago or so is when these thoughts first cohered. And many of you might be familiar with this great classic of Taoism, called the Tao Te Ching, uh, which uh, translates basically as um, quite literally the classic of Tao and De, as it's pronounced. Now, um, some of you probably have some sense of what Tao refers to. Um, it's often translated as something like the way or path, like the sense of how the forces of nature manifest in the world. But very few people are aware of the meaning of de, which is equally important in Taoism, or almost as important, um, which refers to the sense of the spontaneity or intrinsic nature that is inherent in all living things. And when the early Taoists looked at nature all around them, they saw them acting with de, 
with this sense of their intrinsic nature. And, and they had a name for that. They called that Wu Wei, which we can translate as like effortless action. And the Taoists saw basically all non-human organisms acting naturally in Wu Wei, whether they were birds, animals, plants, you name it. But then obviously they turned to humans and they asked this question, what happened to humans? Uh, because in addition to this Wu Wei, this effortless action, they looked at humans and they saw humans acting with what they called Yu Wei or purposive action. And they would describe that uh, Yu Wei as things like using a fire to dry up a well, sort of going against what nature itself does or forcing water uphill to irrigate a mountainside. And so that's what they saw as what humans did. And, and somebody might have asked them at the time, uh, probably did, and uh, we might ask, well, isn't that kind of what civilization is all about, is doing that kind of activity? And the Taoists basically responded to that, yes, exactly. And from that, they, they developed what we might think of as a theory of civilization, which was described well by one of the great Taoist sages called Zhuangzi. And he talked about how the men of old shared the placid tranquility which belonged to the whole world. That was what is called the state of perfect unity. And in those earliest times, people lived in common with birds and beasts and were on terms of equality with all creatures, like forming one family. But then in Zhuangzi's conception, um, <clears throat> something happened and people began everywhere to become suspicious of each other. Civilization developed. And in his, as he described it, with extravagant orchestras and gesticulating ceremonies, men began to be separated from one another. Now, here's what's so fascinating. When we look at the findings of modern cognitive neuroscience, and they've, uh, they now understand the evolution of the human brain in a way that validates exactly this Taoist theory of civilization. Modern neuroscience now recognizes that humans have a, a uniquely highly developed prefrontal cortex at the front of our brain that is <clears throat> recognized to mediate what the Taoists called our Yu Wei cognition, that purposive cognition, which includes things like, in um, modern terms, uh, things like symbolic thoughts, conceptualizing, planning, creating abstractions. And now cognitive anthropologists, when they look at the emergence of um, modern human species, um, they recognize the emergence of that symbolic thought mediated by the prefrontal cortex is what was foundational to things like um, language, the, the emergence of language, culture, art, tool making, all the elements of what then became civilization. So from this finding, uh, from what the, this Taoist conception of our humanity and the validation by modern neuroscience, we can recognize that we in fact have a dual human consciousness. Unlike that idea of Descartes that I think, therefore I am, that we do have a conceptual consciousness, that thinking uh, consciousness that Descartes recognized that's analytic, slow, rational, and effortful, um, <clears throat> that also correlates with that Taoist notion of Yu Wei or purposive action. But in addition to that, we, along with all other mammals around us, have an animate consciousness that's intuitive, that's fast, that's emotional and effortless, which um, corresponds more with that Wu Wei way of acting that the Taoists recognized was something that connected us with all of life around us. So from that, we can recognize that actually our human challenge is not is to just identify with that one thinking consciousness, but to integrate both of those systems in harmony. And so now when we look at this first question, who am I? We can begin to answer that from a different kind of foundation from starting to realize that I am actually a mind body organism that's capable of integration. 
So let's turn our attention to this second question. Where am I? And if we begin once again with what our sort of dominant culture um, thinks and uh, relates about our universe, generally the ideas um, come up in the form of thinking that we live in a kind of a split universe, that there's some sort of um, domain where there's a transcendent God of some kind, and then there's the material world below. And, and these two sort of dimensions of the universe are kind of seen as absolutely separate from each other. And so um, what we sort of take for granted most of the time in um, mainstream thinking today is that religion and science sort of exist in different domains. There's religion looks at those kind of spiritual things and science deals um, with the mechanical world. The, there's a, a, we can look at transcendent meaning and it's separate from the world below. And that sense of separation is found fundamental to this unsustainable worldview, where it's considered to be just okay to pray to that source of transcendent meaning, whatever somebody thinks it might be, um, even while we ransack nature below. But that idea of a split universe, um, again, is not shared by traditional cultures around the world. And if we turn once more to ancient China, there's a fascinating period <clears throat> that I'm going to focus some attention on for a few moments called the, um, this called the Song Dynasty from about a thousand years ago in China. And there a group of sages um, developed what they called for, them, uh, for themselves the school of the Tao. And these sages basically integrated the three great traditions that had been dominant in China for centuries or millennia or more. Uh, one was Taoism that we just looked at. Another was Confucianism, which is fundamental to Chinese thought. And the third was Buddhism that actually arose in India, but arrived in China in the first few hundred years of the common era and had become uh, fully integrated in Chinese thought <clears throat> by that time, about a thousand years ago. And this school of thought synthesized all three to develop a very sophisticated and comprehensive sense of how the universe actually works. So they call themselves a school of the Tao. We know them nowadays by the term Neo-Confucianism. And for the Neo-Confucians, the entire universe actually consists of qi, which we can think of as matter and or energy. But in addition to that qi was equally important what they called li, the principles by which the chi is connected. <clears throat> so all that chi out there can only emerge, only manifest by being organized in certain ways. And it's those principles of organization that they saw as the li. And they saw the totality of all the li in the universe, all those principles of organization. They understood that as being the Tao the ultimate pattern of patterns that infuses the entire universe. Now, what is so fascinating is that modern systems sciences also <clears throat> points to a universe very similar, if not the same kind of universe that those Neo-Confucians were looking at, this universe that's deeply interconnected. Whether we look at um, and different kinds of sciences like complexity science, or systems biology, or chaos theory. And they all share the same underlying understanding that everything is connected. And this connected in non-linear ways. So in the famous um, statement that some of you may have come across from Edward Lorenz, who is the founder of chaos theory, he posed this question once. He said, is it possible that the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil could lead to a tornado in Texas because of this complex nonlinear interactions of these systems. And something that all of these different systems-oriented sciences point to is that the interactions between things often tell us more about them than the things themselves. Whether we're looking at the patterns of starlings flocking in the sky or um, schools of fish in the ocean or the ripples of sand dunes or the entire weather and or system of earth 
or even um, the formation of galaxies. Often it's the ways in which these things interact that are more important. Now that can be difficult sometimes to sort of get your head around because it's so different from what we understand from our modern dominant way of thinking. But there's one uh, really interesting way to get a feel for that. And to do this, I'm going to ask you just to take a moment and to try to um, think of a photograph of yourself when you were a little child. So got that? Well, here's a photograph of me when I was a, a little kid. Now, when I look at that picture of me, I know that's me. And I even may have the memories to prove it. But here's what's so interesting. And <clears throat> basically, um, all the stuff uh, that that little boy is, was made out of, none of it is in me now. Uh, virtually every cell in that little boy is different from the cells in me now. There are, are a few cells in the body that actually remain around in our body in our, our entire life, but even those cells are continually changing their components. And that's why I can be virtually certain that the chi of that little boy, the stuff he was made of, is completely different from me. And yet I know it's me. So what connects me with that little boy? It's the principles of organization the ways in which all that stuff related to each other that actually causes the coherence of the identity of that little boy that causes the memories I have to remain stable, my identity to remain connected with that little boy. It's the Li rather than the Chi, the interactions between things. So <clears throat> then when scientists look at this, they recognize it's critical to understand certain principles about these universal patterns in nature. And one of the most important things that they understand about these patterns is they often show themselves in what are called fractals. You might've come across this term fractal. Um, it refers to a pattern that repeats itself at different scales. It indicates self-organized activity and it's everywhere in the natural world. We see it in the patterns of coastlines, of leaves, of how lightning shows in the sky, the patterning of our lungs, and, and even the patterns of the neurons in our brain. And when scientists look at nature as a whole, they they're beginning to recognize nature itself as a fractally connected system where every cell foundation block of all life. Every cell is organized according to similar principles as those that organize an organism in which the cell is part, or those that <clears throat> cohere the cell species, which is fractally connected with the same principles of ecosystems. And those ecosystems are a fractally connected part of the entire living system of Earth that some people will call Gaia. So then when we turn to this question, where am I? we can begin to answer it from the sense of, well, actually, I am part of a fractally connected, self-organized universe. So let's turn now to this next question. What am I? And one of those early <clears throat> Neo-Confucian sages from a thousand years ago, his name was Chu Shi, made a really profound statement at one time. He said, if one wishes to know the reality of Tao, one must seek it in one's own nature. But if then, if we ask somebody today in, in our dominant culture, what is our nature? Well, it's very likely they'll give you an answer that's based somewhat on this famous uh, book by Richard Dawkins from the 1970s. It's now permeated throughout uh, mainstream culture, this notion of the selfish gene. And in Richard Dawkins' words, um, we and all other animals are machines created by our genes in a highly competitive world. And as a result, he says, a predominant quality to be expected in a successful gene is ruthless selfishness. So um, people who feel they have a better understanding of, these, of what biology they think tells them is that the gene is the fundamental unit of evolution. It dictates everything about the organism, is inherently selfish and competitive. All these are ideas popularized by uh, Dawkins in the selfish gene and others. Um, but what modern biology now shows us is that every one of those assumptions that we think are the truth are actually false. 
It turns out that in fact, genes are part of an iterative process with the cell. They're part of a vibrant, dynamic, circular flow of interactivity. Um, and biologists now explain that we need to understand the genotype itself more like an artist's palette, like a repertoire of capabilities that the cell itself can select based on its particular need as determined by the environment. And just to get a feel for what this actually means in real life, just consider for a moment a grasshopper, this a solitary, gentle creature quietly munching away on, on a leaf. Well, it turns out that grasshopper has exactly the same DNA as a massive swarm of locusts that are known to be aggressive and will kind of sometimes destroy millions of hectares of land in just a few hours. And um, what actually happens is at certain times, uh, certain kinds of grasshoppers actually switch on different parts of their DNA and to express in their bodies, which turns their bodies around to become locusts, and then they can uh, turn those parts off again and become solitary grasshoppers again. So this looks at the fact that genes are not the sole driver of, of who we are as organisms. But what about the selfishness aspect? Well, when biologists now have looked at the evolution of life over billions of years on Earth, and they've seen only certain, a few phases where the complexity of life made a big jump to a higher level from single cells to complex cells, to multicellular life, simple animals, and then mammals. Only a few of these jumps. And when they've studied how these phase transitions took place, they've shown that each one arose not through greater selfishness or competition, but through increases in cooperation when different species figured out how to work together in not a zero sum game, but actually a positive sum game. In, in the words of uh, the systems biologist, Lynn Margulis, um, life evolved through cooperation. Life did not take over the world, as she wrote, by combat, but by networking. And the particular secret that life came across, the species got to understand through these phase transitions of complexity, is a secret of what's known as mutually beneficial symbiosis. It's that symbiosis that leads to this beautiful harmonic dance of life that we experience today. So if you just take a walk in a forest somewhere, what you'll actually have all around you is that symbiosis manifesting itself, where plants photosynthesize energy from the sun and they provide nourishment for other creatures. Insects pollinate those plants, help them to breed. Um, animals will transport their seeds. Meanwhile, those animals, as they get their nourishment, fertilize the soil. The fungus then regenerates their waste products and offers them back as nourishment back to the plants. And as we saw earlier, those mycorrhizal networks, um, of those fungal networks in the ground, help the plants to transport nutrients and to other parts of their, of their system. All this complex, beautiful dance um, of symbiosis. So now systems biologists begin to recognize that organisms themselves are self-organized fractal dynamic patterns. They're resilient patterns in a turbulent flow, in the words of one biologist, Cole Wosa. And we have to understand them in his words, not as machines, but as stable, complex, dynamic organization. Um, and that's what leads to this fractal cascade of abundance that we enjoy in life today on the earth. So when we look at this question, what am I? We can really begin to answer it as, Actually, I am a resilient pattern of self-organized cooperation. So let's turn now <clears throat> to this question, how should I live on the basis of everything that we've just been exploring? Well, the dominant culture is pretty clear about that, right? It tells us that humans are intrinsically selfish and greedy and selfish behavior by individuals is in the best interest of everyone, we're told. In these words of Gordon Gecko <clears throat> from that movie, Wall Street, decades ago, Greed is good. And that's what our neoliberal um, ideology actually has, has pervaded throughout our world today. And even those who don't agree with that um, ethic of greed is good and 
to Richard Dawkins' credit, he certainly doesn't agree with that. They still think we have to overcome our selfish genes. In his words, let us try to teach generosity and altruism because we're born selfish. We need to understand what our own selfish genes are up to because we may then at least have the chance to upset their designs. But actually, what we now understand from evolutionary biology and cognitive anthropology is that humans actually evolved to be cooperative, and that early hominids were vulnerable to predators when they found themselves in the savanna, and those who learns to collaborate were the most successful. And over millions of years, human identity expanded from self and kin to include the entire group. Um, so uh, far from what Richard Dawkins and others think that we have to overcome our selfishness, in fact, the human ability to cooperate with each other, even those who are not kin, is what differentiates us from other primates. And from that, Humans developed what moral, what psychologists call moral emotions, things like compassion, guilt, shame, gratitude, and embarrassment. We don't just act morally because we think we should. We do so because it feels right. And indigenous traditions around the world base their value systems on that. And in, um, in Africa, there's this beautiful concept of Ubuntu, um, which can be translated as I am because you are. Um, the Lakota <clears throat> in North America have the phrase, Nita kuye o yasin, we are all related. And the value system of indigenous um, groups around the world has been identified as having what's <clears throat> known as like four R's of indigeneity, um, a relationship um, concept of recognizing value in relationship with all life, a responsibility, of an imperative to nurture and care for relations, reciprocity to balance what's given and taken, and redistribution ethic to share what one possesses in abundance. And so from that, we can recognize our flourishing is based on our intrinsic connectedness within ourselves, with others, with the natural world, and with the living earth, which leads to a very different life-based value system that we can live according to. That was well expressed by Albert Schweitzer in the 20th century, who said, I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. And as a result, he said, I cannot but have reverence for all that is called life. That is the beginning and foundation of morality. So now as we look at this question, how should I live? On that basis, we can begin to answer that from that foundation of, I should live in reverence and care for all life. And so now let's turn to that final question, the question of meaning itself. Why am I? And if we turn once again to what our dominant culture says, it actually says there is no answer to that. We just live in a pointless universe. This famous spokesperson for reductionism, physicist Steven Weinberg, famously said, the more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. So um, that's what we understand from dominant culture. But if we take this understanding, I've just been taking us through, um, we can begin to recognize that meaning itself is a function of connectedness. That in all these complex systems of which we're embedded, as the number of connections increases, they leads to a phase transition and the emergence of new meaning. And we see that in systems all around us. When words connect, language emerges. When organisms connect, an ecosystem emerges. When neurons connect, consciousness emerges. Many of you might have had some peak experience of oneness in your life where you've got a deep sense through your entire being of being connected with everything around. And oftentimes we're told, well, that's all well and good, but that's not really scientific. Um, but what we can recognize now is that actually those feelings validate from our deep intuition what science actually tells us, which is basically that we live in this vast fractal universe with patterns that are both recognizable and always unfolding. They're mysterious beyond our human comprehension, yet they manifest a deeply meaningful harmony that can permit us, with, maybe with reverence and awe, to touch into its really unfathomable glory. 
And that connectedness has implications. But basically everything you do in your life creates these Lee ripples, which affect everything else in the universe, leading to this fundamental principle of the ultimate connectivity of everything in the cosmos. So we exist in an ocean of Li. And those Li ripples exist within each of us. And the choices we make, the personal choices and actions, the choices to participate in regenerative community or engaging in the broader political process, all of those choices together are what weave the web of meaning. So now <clears throat> when we turn to this final question, why am I? We can say, actually, I'm here to weave my part in the web of meaning. And maybe if enough of us <clears throat> can recognize that element of our existence, together we can create this kind of global um, human superorganism of connectivity and meaning. And if we can act together in this way, we maybe have a chance to regenerate our beautiful, fragile earth. So that concludes my presentation for today. And you can read um, in more detail in this book, The Web of Meaning. And these are ways to um, connect with me online. And uh, now I'm going to stop the share. And um, uh, hopefully in these last few minutes we have in today's presentation, look forward to um, uh, looking at any questions, reflections, that you have from this presentation. I'd love to interact in dialogue with you on this. So thanks very much for listening to this today. Jeremy, that was a fantastic presentation. We've been doing this for over four years now, and I think that's been one of our most interesting yet. So yeah. just thank you so much for, for putting that together. That was that was incredible. Um, um, anyway, I've, I've got a couple of questions for you, Jeremy, just to get started. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So for someone listening to this who wants to develop a more sort of holistic and connected worldview and value system, what would you recommend? Obviously, reading your books would definitely be a, a good first sort of step, but anything practical people can do to sort of start moving in that direction? Yes, for sure. Well, I think maybe the first thing comes in starting to be curious and to look at these kind of things that each of us takes for granted. And I know this in my own life. So I don't like I grew up with this greater understanding. It was only through a big transformation in my own life uh, some years back, I began to realize I'd made assumptions for my dominant culture about life that weren't, weren't true. So looking, being curious about that is one important thing. And a second thing is to open to these connections. Um, so one is to open to connections within ourselves to maybe um, experiment if you haven't done it, things like a mindfulness meditation, or I do um, actually uh, traditional Chinese practices like Qigong, like movement practices, mm. which helps you connect with yourself. But equally importantly is to open to connecting with others in your community and to be looking at the organizations around the world that are, are trying to offer different ways of living and connecting with those and realizing fundamentally that each of us is embedded in these connections. Um, and for those of us who, who um, live in a world of privilege, like in the global North or relatively well-to-do, to realize that even that privilege only arises <clears throat> as a result of the depredations that are being caused elsewhere and to feel into the implications of that and then explore where that might take us. Really interesting. And you've actually got something going at the moment at uh, the Deep Transformation Network. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yes. that as well? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. And maybe we can put that uh, link in the um, in the chat too. In recent times, as, as I gave <clears throat> um, different uh, classes in the last year or so, the strongest sense I got from people is that they want to be connected with each other, that many people see the world in this different way, but feel very isolated in their own communities. Um, and so as a result of this, just recently with the help of some great volunteers, I've created <clears throat> an online global network. It's called the Deep Transformation Network. And you can find it actually at www deeptransformation.network. 
So the suffix is not .net, but .network, thank you. And, and this is a global community. Now almost a thousand people have joined in just a couple of months to connect with each other. And so we can actually share our understandings and build that sense of interconnectedness to look towards what's needed to actually transform our society from this destructive one that we um, find ourselves part of to actually being part of this transition towards something that's more life affirming. 100%. Um, so you mentioned in the talk, Jeremy, that, you know, our cultures shape our value system. Um, mm -hmm. So it seems like the, maybe the root of this is like figuring out how we can maybe re-engineer our culture's value system into one that is more regenerative for the planet at this stage. So for someone listening to this that wants to have an impact there and wants to shape that in the, in the right direction, what would you recommend as first steps as well? Well, I think that what is really important is to be open to what has already uh, been being done in communities around the world. That oftentimes people um, look at how bad things are and say, I've got the, the solution. It's, it's got to be this or that or whatever. And they don't realize that um, others have already been working on similar things and uh, have been leading them to a great degree. So it's like being open, like to really explore what is actually being done out there. Um, so it's kind of very much like about not reinventing the wheel, but actually joining with others in, in helping, helping that to happen. So, because one of the things that is very hard is when we actually look at this destruction that I started this presentation talking about, it's easy to get a sense of doom and gloom, to feel this is more than I can hold. And, and there's the natural human reaction to that is to kind of reject it. It's like, oh my God, this is too much. And you can either fall into this deep depression, say there's nothing we can do, that we're all headed for disaster, or, or else you say, this is too much to hold. I'm just going to ignore it. Let me go back online and just sort of faff around with my friends or whatever. So and the important thing is to um, connect with others um, and find ways to connect in such a way that you can share a sense of that uh, that shared loss, because holding it is a big deal, but we need to hold it just enough to then energize us to actually then connect with others to make things different. And that can be, um, that can lead to things like being out on the streets, like say with Extinction Rebellion or other groups that are really looking at the need for the deep transformation and going out there and trying to make this difference. Or it can be joining with other groups in more kind of spiritually connected ways, but also lead towards engagement. There's a wonderful group called The Work That Reconnects, and you can look that up, that um, was founded by the eco-philosopher Joanna Macy with global, um, as a global network with communities around the world where people share these ideas and they help each other to work through the, both the spiritual, emotional, and active engagement aspects of what's needed. That's really interesting. And I love what you're saying about, you know, what really makes this work is having a, a community element to it and doing it with others and finding organizations that are already doing this. And someone you mentioned, someone whose work you mentioned in the book is, is David Sloan Wilson, who's spoken with us a couple of times before. Right. And something, something he said that I, I really find interesting is that the, clo the closest thing that you'll find to utopia on planet Earth is working in a team towards a shared mission or value that or shared goal that you you find is aligned with your values you know and i yes I think there's a, exactly a, right a truth in that. yeah and that's brilliantly said and and he is really uh, one of those leading thinkers i'm so glad you brought him onto your program who really understands the different ways in which we can organize as human beings um, and one of the uh, thinkers that he has um got very involved in it and um, really helps to enunciate their ideas was um, actually a Nobel Prize winner. Her name is Eleanor Ostrom, who developed um, what's known as the theory of the commons. And this is very interesting because we used to sort of believing that um, there's only, only sort of a, a couple of different ways to organize our society. You can have capitalism where everyone's out to like take advantage of everyone else. Or the other, the other option is like communism or socialism. And uh, we all kind of seen that sort of failed. So we're told to believe like in the words of Margaret Thatcher, who famously said some decades ago, there is no alternative. Um, like that's what we're stuck with. So we've got to try to make it work better. 
but that's not actually the case. And we can look at different ways of organizing based on the commons, which is really the more natural human way of organizing that we did as hunter-gatherers, which involves um, a sense of a recognizer of our shared ownership and responsibility of the resources around us and the need to pass it on to the future generations and the need to organize together where we're relating to each other, where there's not some hierarchical leader telling everyone what to do, but as a group, we self-organize to figure out what's the right thing to do. And when that's done in the right way, it's actually far more effective than those sort of top-down hierarchical um, modes. And that notion of the commons, it sounds like something from medieval times. Like, oh, people pass, put animals out on their pasture or whatever together. It's a very modern concept too, as well as being deeply traditional. So something like Wikipedia, we all know if, um, that how it sort of blew away something like the Encyclopedia Britannica over the last couple of decades. Um, it's the result of the commons, the result of uh, Jimmy Wales, this brilliant, and a person, rather than saying, oh, I'm going to be the next billionaire, I'm going to like make this for profit. He said, no, let me make this a commons built or um, like grouping. So now millions of people around the world, inter they actually share their knowledge, but not because they're trying to make money out of it, but because they get the pleasure out of being part of this beautiful knowledge base for our human superorganism. So that's a perfect example of how the commons can have this power that can blow away um, even the power of our sort of corporate uh, hierarchies today. Uh, if you're interested in really going deeper in this, actually at the end of this book, The Web of Meaning, um, I've got further reading uh, for every one of, so we were looking at all these different existential questions. And um, if you, you find one particular area that you just really wanna kind of go deeper into, uh, you can go to further reading there and you'll see um, like really enough stuff that um, you can sort of form your own kind of project to kind of go, go deeper into this. And I do want to share with people if, if this is, if this kind of ideas of really understand things in your own path uh, feels meaningful to you, this is exactly how I ended up doing my own research for this book, um, The Patterning Instinct and The Web of Meaning by um, looking at, at st actually starting by looking at books like Richard Dawkins, The Selfish Gene or whatever, um, and then questioning it, looking at other ways of looking at things like Fritjof Capra <clears throat> is a great thinker. We could put him in the chat too. Um, and then looking at the footnotes. So if uh, Fritjof Capra would say something about systems thinking and, and would footnote uh, something that looked really key and my imagination got all excited, I'd go there. So I sort of developed my own sort of puzzle, if you will, of figuring out how all these things come together. So it's a wonderful way in which we can kind of organize your own research project over years. It doesn't have to be something that you have to do in place of other things, but to make do your own investigation. I think you've just instigated a lot of people going down very deep rabbit holes. So <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. That's that's such a good suggestion. And, and and let me just add one one thing to that. Uh, by the way, because there there is a thing when sometimes when you go down rabbit holes, you can end up seeking out things that will reinforce your preconceptions, and so you'll think you're getting uh, better and better knowledge. Actually, what you're doing is just being stuck in your own echo chamber and your own kind of silo. And so one of the things I recommend, and I did this in my own understanding, is whenever you think you've figured something out, like, oh, it's all, it's, this is what the key issue is, look for a recognized reputable argument on the other side mm -hmm. and read that too. And so be open to a real dialogue within your own mind of these, uh, like a de debate kind of thing of understanding things. And it's only once you've looked at what the other side says, if you look at their arguments, you say, okay, I recognize what they're saying, but I recognize that I don't think they're right for this or that reason. Then you're doing a good job of really formulating your own path, but don't just look for things that will reinforce your initial point of view. I love that. It reminds me, I think, I think it was Carl Sagan that said, you should be able to argue the other side's point of view better than they mm -hmm. can. Yes, exactly. Uh um, so yeah, Jeremy, that's all we've got time for. I hope you're seeing yeah. some of the messages in the, in the chat. I, I you am. Know, yes. People are, some people are saying is the, you know, the most impactful talk we've ever seen. Like, it's just, you had a really big impact on people here. So, um, just again, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time today. 
it's very, it's very yeah. early morning where, where you are. <laughs> That's so fine. Yeah. More so. Well, um, any parting yeah. words for the for the people watching, or any any final yeah things you'd like um, to share? Yeah, I think the the only thing I would <clears throat> um, say to people who are watching and um, who may be you know really caring and and seeing uh, some of the implications of what I was just taking us through, is to recognize that actually each of us, when we think about where is the future going to lead or anything like that. Each of us is part of that. The ones we recognize that we're all part of this web of meaning, it's that every one of our actions, just like I was saying towards the end of that presentation, is actually part of this unfolding. So the future is not like some spectator sport that's happening somewhere else that others are doing. The future is what we, all of us, are co-creating together. And that can uh, both be somewhat um, of an awesome sense of responsibility. Like, oh, you mean I can't, I'm not off the hook. I've got to actually be part of this. But also this to a sense of freedom because we recognize that we actually can be connected with others. None of us are going to make these changes ourselves, but by connecting with what we see around us, we can be part of a much more positive future for humanity. And that can really give a sense of meaning to your own life and your own plans for where, you, um, where your life unfolds. Well, that's a great note to end on, Jeremy. Thank you so much.